Yeah, thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, so you've made it. We're nearly at the end of uh, Europe Python. I'm so glad that there are still people here. Uh, I noticed some people going off to the airport already. So I'm really happy that you're all here. So thank you very much for joining my talk. Uh, I won't do an anecdote. I think you've heard enough uh, during the conference. I'll just dive into my talk. I'll first briefly introduce myself, who am I? And then we're going to talk about uh, the actual substance. Uh, so my name is uh, Sebastian. I'm from the Netherlands. I live near The Hague. Uh, I love it there, and I work for a company called Ordina, and more specifically the Ordina Pythoneers, which is a smaller practice within our company that really focuses on Python development. Uh, I'm also one of the codesmiths, which means that I get some time for innovation, for conferences, being here, but also just to explore Python with all the other Python developers at my company uh, and at other companies as well, just to have a little bit of fun with Python. I think that's really important, to have fun with Python, to really um, dive into it and make it your passion, at least for me, um, that's really what I love. In my spare time, I'm one of the volunteers uh, for EuroPython here. This year I was the FinAid lead for the financial aid program, um, and I also did some session chairing. It was really interesting. I'm really happy that we've made it so far uh, into the conference. And I'm also one of the founders of Python Discord, which is a larger online Python community uh, with a lot of teenagers, but also older folks who are trying to learn Python, discuss Python, and do other stuff with Python. So definitely check it out if you haven't heard about it. Anyway, that's enough about me. Let's talk about Python. So what are we going to do today? Well, basically, we're going to make a journey a journey all the way from the source code of Python to the execution. And for me, it's kind of like writing magic spells. I used to play games like D&D &D and stuff like that. And with programming languages, you get to write something, and then something happens. Often it's not what I want, but at least something happens. So and that's what we're going to see today. I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to show you how Python gets from the source code all the way to the magic, all the way to the execution. Uh, I'm not just going to give you a lecture about that. I think that would be rather boring, uh, but I'm going to show you how to implement a new operator in Python, and that will naturally take us all the way from that source code to that execution. However, do note, I have a serious disclaimer for this talk. Uh, we have time constraints, so I'm going to omit things. There will be blatant omissions. There will be gross oversimplifications. I will take shortcuts. The implementation will not be ideal, but hopefully it will give you an overview of what happens within in the Python internals. All right. Um, if you do like to know more details, if you're interested after this talk, definitely check out the Python Developer's Guide on devguide.python.org. It contains a lot of information about how you can mess with the Python internals, how to compile it, but it also has excellent explanations about the parser, grammar, and everything else. And then obviously there's uh, Anthony Shaw's book, C Python Internals, published by Real Python. It's a great book, definitely check it out if you're interested in this. All right, so what is our journey today? Well, we're going to go from source code to execution basically in two parts. In the first part, we're going to look at the tokenizer and the parser to create something called an abstract syntax tree. And then in the second part, we're going to take that abstract syntax tree and go all the way to the magic uh, using the compiler and the evaluation loop. Um, by the way, if you want to check out the slides or the source code for the, 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 the version of Python that we're creating today, check out the GitHub repository, everything's there. A couple of versions of the slides, one version of the source code, but do note, it's an educational implementation. Don't use it in production. I'm not maintaining it, it's a crappy implementation. Please don't use it for anything serious. All right, what is a pipe operator? Well, a pipe operator is something that's part of a lot of languages, but not Python. And it's basically another way of calling functions. So say you have a function that takes one argument, like this double over here, it just takes a number and it multiplies the number by two, and it returns the value. Well, the pipe operator allows you to call this function in a different way. You provide the value on the right-hand side of the operator, then you use the operator itself, then you name the function, and then the argument will be passed into the function, and you get the result out of it. Well, this is obviously not really interesting, it's just like calling the function double one. But what you can do with this is you can build pipelines. So you can start with a single value, then you can pipe it into various functions to process it, and you get something out the other end. So in this case, this would be equivalent to calling double one, and then insert that into another double call, the nested function call. So this is what we're going to do today. Well, 
just to be clear, this is not a part of Python. I don't think it will ever be a part of Python. There were a few proposals for this. They were rejected for good reasons. Maybe in the future, who knows? Ask a core developer, not me. Um, and the implementation is purely educational. I've already mentioned that. So, the first part. We want to get from the source code, so the characters uh, um, on the right-hand side, all the way to that abstract syntax tree that you see there. So this tree-like representation of your source code. So if you have a single Python file with this line in it, only this line, you'll get something like you see there, the tree representation of your source code. You have a module, a single expression, it's a binary operation, an operation with two operands and value to the right-hand side and a value to the left-hand side. Uh, and that binary operation has a constant, a 10, it has the operator itself, the call pipe, and then it loads a name, the name of the function. Obviously, this won't work in a file on its own because there is no function here, but this is the general idea of what we're trying to do in the first part. We're trying to get from that part to that nice tree over there. So first look at our source code. We humans, we are very good in reading. We recognize patterns, we immediately see that we have a 10, that we have a name double, that we have a weird operator in the middle that is unfamiliar in Python, but at least we immediately recognize the bits. But if you think about it, for Python, at the start, this is just a stream of individual characters. There are 12 characters here, and they make up our source code, and Python has to understand those characters. And the first step Python takes is basically extracting the tokens from this source code. And tokens are the minimal parts that still have a meaning. So for instance, we have a number token over here. If you split this up even further into a one and a zero, you lose the meaning of the number 10. We have a name over here. Obviously, if you remove a character, it's no longer the same name. So this is a name token. And the first thing that we need to implement is that Python will recognize this token here in the middle, this operator, this two-character operator, as one single token. This isn't very difficult to do. This is just a configuration in a file. If you look in the Python repository, there's a file grammar slash tokens, and it's just a big mapping of token names to token character sequences. So all that we have to do is we have to add our own token into this file. And there's no meaning here yet. This is just a description of the token. So I've called it V bar greater, fill the vertical bar greater, and I've mapped it to the token sequence that we want to introduce. Um, this isn't uh, uh, all of it, but what we still need to do is regenerate the tokenizer itself, the actual uh, uh, piece of Python that will uh, get these tokens from your source code, because Python will not read this file every time it tries to parse source code. For that, we just have to run some commands, and this will be a recurring theme in this presentation. Change something, run a command, and then you can see the result. So these are the commands. I'm not going to go into detail in all, those, in, in all these commands, because you can find them on the internet and you're not going to remember them here anyway. But after we've done this, Python will now be able to recognize our new token, our uh, a VBAR greater token. And that's already a big step but it doesn't really know what to do with that token. So there's no grammar rule that tells Python, if you see this token, then this has to happen. So the next thing that we will need to do is we need to add support for this new token in Python's parser by adding it to Python's grammar. Well, the grammar also has to produce something, which is the abstract syntax tree that we saw earlier. So we also have to tell the grammar how to generate the abstract syntax tree and make sure that there's something for our coal pipe available in that abstract syntax tree. So let's look at our grammar yet. So uh, since Python 3. Point, oh, I forgot, 3.9, uh, the new pack parser has been introduced uh, and this has a completely new grammar. It's very flexible, it's very powerful, um, but we first have to look into the syntax of that grammar just a little bit to add our own rule. So I'm just going to take a very small dive into the parse and expression grammar that uh, Python uses, just enough to know uh, to define our new rule for the call pipe operator. So if you imagine a very simple programming language, and it only has two expression types. It has a sum, and it has something called an atom. And in this very simple language, there are only two grammar rules the sum and the atom. There might be some other for statements and stuff like that, but we, we're going to ignore that for now. We're going to focus on these two. 
then this is basically what you can define in pack parser. This is a little bit simplified, uh, but these could be grammar rules. And just to color code them, grammar rules can reference each other. And this is how Python goes down all the grammar rules to see what it matches. So it first try, starts by trying to match the sum rule. And within the sum rule, there are options that reference the atom rule, which is just a number. And that is how we ever consider the uh, atom rule. So if we just have this single piece of uh, um, source code, it's just a number. It will first try to, uh, to match the sum rule. It has two alternatives. That's what the vertical bars mean. It has an atom plus an atom, and it has an atom on its own. So this matches the second alternative in the sum rule, which is an atom. Then we look at the atom because it's just a number. So we can parse this. So in this very simple grammar example, we can parse a number on its own. How, what about this one? Well, on this one, we have an atom, a number, plus, and then another atom, which matches the first rule of the sum. So it's very easy to see that this grammar rule will now be able to match this simple piece of grammar as well. But now what about this one? Think about it for a moment. Are our grammar rules able to parse this very simple statement? I see some people shaking yes, others shaking no. Well, the problem here is that when you start parsing your expression, you will consume these parts. We can parse this very easily. And what we're then left with is a plus and a three. And we have no rule that matches a plus and a three on its own. So how are we going to match something with two pluses? Obviously, we can add another rule. But what if we want an atom plus an atom plus an atom plus another atom? Do we have to add another rule? And if we want four pluses or five or six, or if we want an infinite pluses, we'd be busy quite a long time if we wanted to add alternatives for all those different scenarios. But there's a very simple solution for that. And you're probably going to love this. It's just recursion. So what we can do is we can change the first uh, alternative in the sum rule. We can make it reference itself. And now we can have sums that are embedded in other sums, embedded in other sums. And just remember, a sum can also just be an atom on its own. So we can still match an atom plus an atom. But now we can also match a sum contained in another sum. And this is basically all that you need to do to get an arbitrary number of operators in a row. And if you think about it, this is precisely what we need for our new pipe operator. We also want to be able to build an arbitrary long pipeline. So the grammar rule that we will need to add is a grammar rule that has such a recursive relationship. So let's see that. This is the existing grammar file in Python, grammar slash python.gram. Here you see the shift expression if you want to do bit shifting, and you see the sum expression. And I'm just going to insert our new grammar rule between those two. So let's make some space. Um, this is probably isn't the best place to insert it, but it means that it's very easy to insert it. So that's why I've chosen it. So here we're going to add a new rule. Let's call it pipe. And as you can see here, this is just our recursive relationship. There's just one problem. Our grammar rule isn't referenced by any other grammar rule in Python. So the, the parser will never consider it when parsing source code. So what do we have to do? Well, if you look at the, at the shift expression, it actually references the sum expression. That's how the grammar rules flow down. So the only thing that we need to do to insert it, we have to change the references in the shift expression to the pipe one, and in the pipe, uh, can then reference the sum one. So if we change this, the shift expression now references the pipe one, the pipe the sum one, and now our grammar rules can flow down again. And this is basically the only thing that we need to do to add our new grammar rule for our new uh, pipe call operator. So, now we can parse this, right? We're done. Well, not quite, but because we also still need to be able to create the, the tree structure that you see there on the right. We have to be able to fit it into our abstract syntax tree. So how are we going to do that? Um, in the old parser, there used to be an intermediate step, the concrete syntax tree, but with the new pack parser, we don't need that anymore. And the reason why is that because we now have something called grammar actions. And if you look here, this is a grammar action between the curly braces, and because we're targeting C Python, this is basically just a piece of C code that is embedded into the grammar file. So whenever Python matches a sum rule, it will then call this C function 
to create the classes that we see there, to create the tree, tree structure that we see there. Well, to create a binary operation tree structure, we need the right-hand side of the operator, so the value, we need, we need the left-hand side, and we need the operator. So that's the information that we're going to pass into this function, and that we can do by assigning names to the parts that we match in our expression. So we match an A to the right-hand side, pass it into the function, we match a B to the left-hand side, pass it into the function. We know that this is an add operation because this is the sum rule, so we can hard code the add operator. And there are some extra bits having to do with line number and stuff like that. We're going to ignore that for now, but they're very handy for tracebacks and other kinds of uh, interesting things. Um, so this is all we need to create a binary operation with an add operator. Can we now do that for our own rule? Obviously, we can just copy the approach because our new operator is also a binary operation. So we can just make it call the same function, but instead of using the add operator, we can use the call pipe operator here. Just one tiny problem. The AST uses classes, and there is no class called call pipe yet. It just doesn't exist yet. So we have to create that so that we can actually build this abstract syntax tree with that call pipe node somewhere in the middle for the operator field. So how do we do that? Is it difficult? Do we have to code a lot? Luckily not, because this is another configuration file. This is in parser slash python.asdl, which stands for abstract syntax definition language. And as you can see here, somewhere in the middle, there's a part for the operator. And here's our add option, just in an option list. Uh, and this is all you need to do to uh, uh, have a generator create classes for you. So what do we have to do? Just add our new operator at the end as another option. Then we regenerate the AST, we run another command, and now our classes will be created for us. So this is all we have to do to add support in the AST. Now we can regenerate the entire parser, and now we are actually able to parse expressions with the call pipe operator in it. You can see here that we have a binary bin op node somewhere in our AST3, and it actually uses a call pipe class object in there to represent the operator. So this is all that we need to do for the new grammar. And now we're done. Now we can go from source code to an abstract syntax tree. But this is all fairly static. Nothing happens yet. So to do that, we need to move on to part two, where we're actually going to, uh, rent, uh, where we're actually going to transform this into something we can run and then actually execute it. So in part two, we will look at the compiler so if you've ever joined an online discussion about is Python a compiled language or not, please don't, they're all very toxic. Uh, but we are going to compile this into some form of an intermediate language. We're going to compile this into a little bit of bytecode. Um, and to do that, we need to have a bytecode for our new operator because bytecode is just a long list of instructions for Python, a long sequence of bytes, a long sequence of numbers, and each instruction that we're going to execute has its own number or its own byte, and we need one for our new operation. And obviously, there is already a bytecode for calling functions, but I'm going to ignore that one because it isn't fun to use what's already in Python. So, we're going to add support to the compiler by creating our own instruction, then we're going to make the compiler actually use that instruction, write it into the bytecode, and then we're going to, uh, uh, to add support in the evaluation loop to actually do something with that code. So let's do that. This is the only fi Python file that we'll see today. We can use it to define our operation codes, our opcodes. Um, our opcode doesn't have an argument. Don't worry about that for now, but it means that it has to have a number lower than the have argument constant. So I'm just going to add it here. I'm going to call it binary pipe call. That's for us, so that we can understand it. And the bytecode, the number that we associate with the operation is 90. And I have to increase all the numbers below it. That's a tedious job, but we'll have to do it. Now we can regenerate all the opcodes. Do you see the pattern yet? And now the opcode will actually be generated for us. Right, now we have an opcode. Now we still need to make the compiler actually write that opcode into the bytecode. So how are we going to do that? Well, the compiler is just going to visit all the nodes in our AST, and it has functions that handle that visit. And somewhere in our compiler, there's a function called compiler visit expression one, which eventually gets called to handle expressions. We don't actually have to change it, but there's an important fact here. 
If you look at this function, it's just a massive switch case operations. And for each type of expression, including the binary B bin up kind, uh, there's a special case. And here's our case. We first are going to visit the left-hand side of the operator, which is really important because we need that value, write all the instructions for it. Then we're going to visit the right-hand side, write all the instructions to evaluate the right-hand side. And then we're going to add the operation for the operator. And uh, to know which opcode to write, there's a helper function, bin up, and this is the function that we actually need to change. This is another switch case statement. This will get an AST node like this add here, and it will return the bin up that we actually want to execute or add to the bytecode. So we need to add another case, write our binary pipe call operator, and now we can write it into the bytecode. There's one final thing that we need to change in the compiler. It's the stack effect. Python uses a value stack. You'll see that later. Uh, and the effect of our operation is that our value stack decreases by one value. But don't worry about that for now. And this is the compiler. And now we can go from an AST to a long list of instructions. And this is all we need to write our uh, new operator, our new opcode into the bytecode. And now we get to the evaluation loop. And this is really where the magic happens. The evaluation loop, like the name says, is just one giant loop that goes around and around and around and around, executing all the instructions in the bytecode. And inside of that loop, there is a massive switch case statement. And I'm not uh, exaggerating, it's really massive. Look at the source code in python slash cevel.c. And for each opcode, it has a case. So for instance, here is the binary subtract. And this is the code that actually gets executed whenever it sees such an opcode for a binary subtract, something minus something else. But here we have a problem, because how do we get the values that were to the right and to the left of the operator? How do we get them back to actually process them here? Well, this is why Python uses a value stack. Um, and from that value stack, we can get the values that we need to perform the operation. Now, how does that work? Say that we have this simple expression, 4 minus 1. What we saw earlier is that Python will first write the instructions to evaluate the left-hand side. When it's done, it will put that value onto the value stack to remember it. Then it will evaluate the right-hand side, and it will put it onto the value stack. And the value stack is really a stack. It will put a 3 on top of the four on the value stack, just so that we're able to use them later. So when we enter this new function for the operator, the three and the four are on our value stack. So now that we can use the pop macro just to get the three out of the value stack and uh, make right point to that value. Uh, for left, we do something similar. We leave it on the value stack, but we make left refer to that value that's there on the value stack. Now we have our, uh, our values. We can call a C API function, pi number subtract, pass in the two values. We get a result out of it. Result will now point to the one. We are now done with those values. We can uh, decrease the reference counts for the values. And then at the end, we need to do something with the result, with the resulting value. So what do we do? We just put it back on the value stack. We're going to replace the value that was already there. So after performing the operation, there's one less value on the value stack, and that was the minus one that we saw earlier. Then there's some error handling, and then we do a dispatch to say to the evaluation, please move on to the next value. So how do we do that for a binary pipe call? Well, we just copy-paste this code, because this does basically what we need. We change the targets to our binary pipe call operator. We get the values like we did before. But now we don't want to subtract them. We want to call a function with a value. There's a very handy C API function in Python 3.9. It's not in the, the long-term stable one, so it might be deprecated. But it's very handy here. And here you can call a function with one argument. Uh, and remember, the function was on the right-hand side. So we pass in function uh, right first. The value was on the left-hand side, so we pass it in second. We get the result, decrease the reference counts and we uh, put the resulting value back on the value, st uh, value stack. And this is all we need to do to get from the AST to the magic. And now we've completed our journey. We can go all the way from source code to execution and all the steps that are in between. There's just one thing left to do. Let's compile our new version of Python. 
and if you're waiting for it, you, can, you might as well just have a sort fight. And after that's done, you can run your new version of Python, and you can use your operator. It will actually uh, work if you follow these steps. There are some quirks, especially in operator precedence with this implementation, but it will work in principle. And basically, that's it. We've seen a lot of Python internals uh, in a short time. Don't worry about it. This is just for a framework. Check out the books, the dev guide. Source, uh, source code and slides are available. And if you get weird errors, try running make clean or clean all on Windows and look into something called the magic number because we've changed the bytecode version, so we need to change the bytecode version in CPython as well. Um, before we go, I hope you've, been, you've enjoyed your Python. It's been uh, great for me, but we also need to organize the next edition in uh, 2033. I don't know when or where it's going to be, but if you want to be a volunteer just like me, uh, join us to help organize Python uh, 23. You can send an email there, or you can just uh, talk to me after my talk. And that's it. I hope you've enjoyed my talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow, wow, wow. Uh, I expect the only, we, we're going to see a lot of forks of Python nowadays. Like. <laughs> um, so do we have questions? So when you'll be ready, just queue up. And we, have, we can, OK, go on. Just something silly. Uh, in the beginning, when you created the tokenizer, mm -hmm. you had a symbol there. Uh, did you use that afterwards? I don't remember. The, the symbol, the, 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 the vertical bar and the... Yeah, the V bar uh, yeah. greater. Yeah. Well, we don't use the name. that, that We can use it to tokenize our output, uh, but we haven't used the name in the grammar. Um, so we haven't used the name, but the, the token sequence is obviously our new operator. So that's the actual operator that we use. Yeah. Um, so, so why did we give it a name? Um, because we had to. Mostly for us humans to make it readable. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Okay. Another one, please. Yeah. Thank you for the talk. I really enjoyed it. I have like a stupid question. Like every time I'm hear that like the bytecode evaluation is just a loop. Looking at the top of the stack, it seems so like limiting. Like. You have just like one value you can look at. How does it happen that it like has like normal performance? Like it doesn't. Yeah, it's very interesting. So there are obviously a lot of uh, optimizations since there, but basically this is just kind of like a virtual machine. You have instructions, you have a value stack that you can track of some kind of register, and and that's really powerful. You can really do a lot with it. So maybe in the advent of code, which is an online puzzle, I think in the 2019 edition, you will actually build your own kind of like int code computer using your own kind of bytecode and targets. So I recommend you to check that out and you can really see how powerful it can be. So uh, I, I'm not quite sure how uh, uh, performant you can get it, but uh, have fun. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> So um, I don't see anyone else keen. I have a question, though. Yeah. So one minute uh, to describe what's the magic number. The magic number. So uh, I actually had a, a file about this. So whenever Python uh, compiles your code, it will write to a PyC file. You've probably seen it somewhere. And that bytecode is versioned. It has all the instruction numbers in there. But if you're going to change the instruction numbers, and obviously, all the old bytecodes, they're no longer valid. They use the old numbers. So there's a kind of a versioning in Python. It's called the magic number, and it will version that bytecode. You can actually change that magic number if you change the, the, the bytecode opcodes so that all the old uh, PyC files will be uh, marked as, uh, how do you say that, stale, and it will recompile all your Python. So just to avoid very weird things happening with old bytecodes, with changed bytecodes, it gets a mess. So that's why that's the, the magic number. Yeah. Thanks. Well, thank you. And this is the, all the time we have. So uh, please uh, give a round of applause now. Thank you very much.